Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Good evening and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. And I'm Bob Mann, professor at LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication. Well, last month marked the beginning of a new school year for most public school students in the state. For several parishes in South Louisiana, though, record floods delayed the start of classes until early September. As teachers in those areas return to the classroom, they'll be facing more challenges than damaged supplies and displaced students. You know, Bob, when it comes to public education in Louisiana, terms like unsatisfactory and unacceptable aren't just found on report cards. One national survey this year gave the entire state system a D-plus for overall performance. Another recent education survey ranked Louisiana worst in the country. But are these assessments justified? Over the next hour, we'll hear from educators, students, administrators, and policymakers about the state of the state's education system. We'll explore new federal legislation and highlight stories of success in areas that still need improvement as we formulate our own grade, pass or fail. These third graders at Midway Pre-K-3 in Shreveport are reciting the school's creed. It's a pledge to succeed that each student in the school began learning three years ago and one they've been keeping. This school, like many other schools in our system, saw many years of academic low performing, but within the transformation zone we established new leadership. We hired every teacher. Uh, every support person in this school and because of that effort and the hard work that's gone in we've seen this school transform itself uh, to not only coming out of academically failing status but to be identified as a Louisiana top gain school. Dr. Theodis Gorey is superintendent of schools in Caddo Parish. Gorey took the position in 2013. Within one year he instituted a plan to reimagine the schools in the district. It placed priority on chronically low-performing schools by placing them in transformation zones. We started with 10 schools, uh, and we did see over the first year we saw three of those schools exit uh, the failing status. Uh, we saw school one school also be labeled as a Louisiana top gain school. Not only did three schools come out, we saw some 60% of those schools showed measurable increases in their performance. 67% of Caddo Parish students come from poor households. The district began providing wraparound dental and medical services to better prepare them for learning. Inside the classroom, Gorey instituted something he calls tie-breaking skills. Those things that are as simple as saying yes sir and yes ma'am, uh, saying thank you when something's given to you. Uh, these are skills that I truly believe many of our students uh, from uh, poverty situations are, are not learning at home. The move transformed failing schools like Fair Park High. The state was prepared to shut it down when Gorey arrived. He negotiated a contract to save Fair Park by improving students' motivation. This school saw over 100% decline in things such as arrest, uh, uh, discipline referrals, and we really did change the climate and culture to a place where students were excited to come to school and excited to be there. The school saw a 20% jump in graduation rates to 65%. The entire district is 75.2 percent. Louisiana's graduation rate increased for the fifth straight year in 2015 to 77.5 percent. Well, our state has gone through a lot of changes in education. The good news is that they're bearing fruit for our kids. Higher ACT scores, the highest graduation rate of all time, nationwide leader in the gains in fourth grade reading, second in the, in the nation in mathematics. That says something. It says that these changes are working. But State Superintendent John White also admits the state is still not where it needs to be. One challenge to improving Louisiana's academic rankings, he says, is a shortage of properly prepared teachers. One simple way to solve that is to have educators come into our profession trained in a professional way, 
like lawyers, like doctors, like nurses, like architects, like other professionals who have a four-year university degree. We need one full year in the classroom while you're still in college as a resident teacher. Our State Board of Education is considering that change to become one of the first states in the nation to adopt that practice in October, and I sincerely hope that they will. White is also optimistic about the support that the new federal legislation, Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESA, provides for schools most in need. The federal law uh, gives resources to schools that serve large numbers of low-income students. It is a way of trying to create an equitable opportunity for kids, even though they may come in behind or have struggles at home. Superintendent White has been holding public hearings as part of a year-long review of education policies prompted by ESA. Governor Edwards, who differs with White on key education issues, created his own 15-member ESA review panel. The makeup of the group gives Bridget Nealon with the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry pause. Clearly, the appointees do not include any of the representatives of the education reform movement. Neelan supports the state's current accountability system and appreciates efforts to tweak it, but she questions the need for a separate council to examine it. We already have a state accountability commission which has fair representation from parents, business unions, school boards, special education advocates, and that is an advisory commission to the State Board of Education, and that's the proper place for um, recommendations. Neela notes the State Education Department's review is already yielding results. Some people have concerns about testing, and the State Department's been reviewing tests, and they've uh, identified about 38 percent fewer tests in the high schools. For too long, I think our legislators have heard one voice, and that is the voice of business and of those who are um, in the corner of the reform movements. Our teachers haven't been in that corner. Debbie Moe is president of the Louisiana Association of Educators and a member of the Governor's Advisory Council. Her group is also holding statewide public hearings. She is hopeful that ESA will lead to a better way to measure the effectiveness of teachers. The evaluation system that exists in Louisiana relies too heavily on um, scores. The value-added modeling is a source of contention for a lot of our teachers because a lot of our teachers believe that the performance of a student on a test really doesn't give a full picture of who he or she is as a teacher or who the child is as a student. As the state considers changes to its education system, the goal, Gorey says, needs to remain the same. We must focus on creating a more educated community if we're truly to see change come about. If we're to see our city education system continue to improve, if we're to see people choose Louisiana as a home, if we're to see people choose Caddo Parish as a home, we only benefit by producing a more educated population. Joining us to explore Louisiana's education system is our studio audience. It includes members from the Louisiana PTA, the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry, the School Boards Association, Associated, Associated Professional Educators of Louisiana, and the Louisiana Association of Educators. We also have high school members of the Louisiana Legislative Advisory Council from Thibodeau and Opelousas, and we want to thank everyone for being here with us tonight. In February, LSU's Public Policy Research Lab surveyed over 1,000 Louisiana citizens on tonight's topic. Here's a look at some of the responses. When asked the grade they would give to Louisiana's public schools overall, 35% of respondents said a C. An equal percentage of those surveyed, 22%, give the system either a B or a D. 13% graded public schools as F, and only 4% would give them an A. Yet when they were asked about the public schools in their local community, 30% of those responding grade them with a B, 28% give them a C grade, and 19% grade them as worthy of an A. 12% give them a D, and 10% give them a failing grade. Despite an accountability system that has received praise nationally, 69% of respondents did not know the grade their local school district had been given by the Louisiana Department of Education. When asked about their support of tax-funded scholarships for children to move from a failing public school to a private school, Respondents were almost evenly split with a slight majority, 48%, favoring the vouchers, 
46% opposed them. And when asked an open-ended question about the biggest problem that public schools must deal with, nearly one quarter, 22%, said funding and teacher pay. 14% said safety and discipline issues. Family background, including home life and socioeconomic conditions, was mentioned third most frequently. Only 3% cited teacher quality. So let's start there. What are the biggest problems or challenges that our education system faces and have recent reforms moved us in the right direction or the wrong direction? Who would like to, to start off by taking that, that one? Sonny, why don't you? It starts with a great teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You know, and it takes support, uh, professional development for every teacher. Uh, it goes a long way in, in helping those teachers uh, know how to, uh, how to deal with classroom management and, and you know, knowing what the pedagogy is in, in, the, in the discipline that they're teaching, it goes a long way in if, if those children are going to be successful in that. And how do you think they're doing? I mean, what, what grade would you give our schools overall in the state? Well, I, I would give my school system an A because <laughs> I'm, I'm in the A school district. Uh, across the state of Louisiana, I said we're probably doing uh, C and B. Okay. Kara? Um, contradicting to what he said, um, Louis. Schools in Louisiana, most teachers have their lemon teachers in the school system that have tenure in the system as well. And lemon teachers are basically those few sour teachers in the school that are messing everyone up, messing the students up, and also passing on to other teachers. And they have tenure, which means they are connected to the system. They've been there for so long, it's hard to get rid of them. What do you mean by a lemon teacher? What's, what's, describe what a lemon teacher would be, would be like. A to lemon you. teacher is basically like um, those two bad teachers out of the 20 teachers you have in your school that are bad, like they're extricating bad examples onto the students. They mm -hmm. um, don't have great teaching habits. They're making the students feel like they can't do it. Like, they're not um, promoting the students as well as they should be. Okay, all right, Gretchen? Tenure in Louisiana is not a right, it is not a, a lifetime guarantee of any job. Uh, we deal with people constantly who are uh, asking to, be, to leave the profession and they have the right to due process if they happen to have tenure, but remember when Act One passed, Tenure is not in Louisiana anymore unless you've had five years out of six of highly effective evaluations, you cannot be granted tenure in Louisiana. And for the most part, you can be an at-will employee. And I believe that most administrators now recognize that and we work on a constant basis with administrators and uh, on improvement plans or uh, helping people try to improve and if, if they can't improve then the administrators will move them out of the system. Bruce? My personal belief, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching for 17 mm -hmm. years. I've taught first grade and now I'm teaching fourth grade and my belief is that there needs to be more teacher training. Um, I've, student, I've had student teachers and sometimes they come in with a very um, optimistic perspective mm -hmm. because they really want to make a difference but then there's not enough uh, mentoring programs in the system to make sure they have the support they need so that way once they do graduate from college they have that in the schools so if they do run across issues that maybe they're not accustomed to dealing with because they did not have that background experience in college there's a program to help pick them up so that way they can have what they need so they can endure the obstacles that they face in their particular public school and for teachers that she's speaking of that are not that are the sour teachers. I think in those particular cases, I think administrators need to get with those particular educators and find out what their issues are to figure out you know, what kinds of things that that principal can do for that teacher to try to help build that teacher up so she can support the students like they deserve to be supported. So our survey said that, that people do not <coughs> generally think teachers are the problem in our education system. They, they're not crazy about it, but they don't think teachers are the problem. So what, what, what do you think is our, is our problem? Uh, um, Keith? Well, I wanted to speak positively on two points okay. first. I wanted to say, especially with what they pay us as teachers, and it's been about five years since I've been outside the classroom, it's a mission field. You're there for kids. If someone isn't there for kids and self-sacrificing, no matter where they're teaching, they're not going to be there for long. But I also wanted to speak, because we're sitting here trying to find these problems, 
I was born and raised outside of New Iberia, Louisiana, and I can tell you the things that I learned in high school, we got through probably about eight or nine weeks of chemistry. And as a chemistry teacher, you know, years later in Louisiana in a rural district in Livingston Parish, we got through 18 weeks of it. And we taught so much more what we're teaching kids and what kids are learning. Let's ever never lose sight of the fact that education today is miles ahead of where it was 10 and 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Brian. One of the big issues is that there are too many issues. We are focusing on several different types of reform and too many things that are going into that. And it's really hard as a system to put things into place and to focus on one thing because every time you turn around, it's Jumpstart or mm -hmm. it's ESSA or it's this or it's that. And as teachers and as professionals, as students, when you're, when you're talking about new standards and now Louisiana standards from Common Core standards and then moving forward with all of the things that are being pushed as reform and as initiatives, it's really difficult to put all of that in a priority and in the proper perspective so that everybody can be moving forward in the right direction. And for some districts, things are in better places so they can move forward. For other districts, there's so much that has to be addressed that you can't address it all at one time, but they're required to do that. So if we could cut back on all of the things that have to be done and let us focus on teaching students to get them prepared for where we need to be, life could be a lot better in Louisiana as it would be throughout the nation. So, uh, we, you know, we, we're giving these, uh, we're giving the school system, we're giving, the, we're, we're giving everything, everybody a grade, the te everybody from the students to the teachers to the schools. Or is that a good thing to be grading schools uh, and, and giving these schools a letter grade, uh, Gretchen? I don't believe it is. Why I is believe, that? I, and here's why I don't believe it is. Because of the way the accountability system works in Louisiana, it gives very little thought to things like growth. So if I'm teaching in a system and I have a school that has a lot of students who really need to catch up on things, I should be looking at how much we're growing those students. You have to take students from where you get them and then try to move them forward. I can't take a student who comes in at second grade level and overnight <clears throat> make them read on the eighth grade level uh, I need to take that student from where they are and move them forward. And we don't give credit like we need to for growth. So you may give my school an F while my school may have moved kids um, along the line. So that's very good. Yeah. Let me get, I want to get uh, uh, yeah. Arthur or yeah. Joe, would you like to maybe, uh, you might well, have a different perspective Tom, on that. I've listened to a lot of very good comments and I really enjoyed Kyra's uh, comment about the, about the lemon teacher. Mm -hmm. but. The, the side of it that we see from business, that the side of it that I see from interviewing countless numbers of people looking for employment that are unemployable to a point. And when I say unemployable, <clears throat> you have to have something just like this lady talked about, having someone, you have to start with what you get. And I think that preparation is very, very important. Before the child gets to school, gets to go to school, they should be prepared by their parents. We haven't talked much about parental involvement, but in, in the cases that I've seen around the country, and I've, been, I've lived in several locations, I've seen the most successful school districts are those school districts that have a high parental involvement with regard to their children's education. Now, that doesn't mean just going to PTA meetings. That means parental involvement in the whole aspect of education, from the time that they're able to learn their alphabet to count, to read, and so on and so forth. Those are the things that need to be taught because we get numbers of people applying for jobs that have no, what you would call, soft skills. They can't read. They can't yeah. write. They can't add. They can't subtract. They can't communicate. They have no concept of what it's like to deal with the public. We're going to have to uh, pause it there, but thank you for that. And uh, that's all the time we have left for this portion of our show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore Louisiana's K-12 through education system. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. 
Tonight we're discussing Louisiana's K-12 education system. We just heard some great points from our studio audience and now our panel of experts is going to weigh in. Scott Richard is the executive director of the Louisiana School Boards Association, which represents school board members in 69 systems. A former classroom teacher and administrator with Louisiana's Education Department, Richard is also a member of the Governor's Advisory Council on the Every Student Succeeds Act. James Garvey is the president of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, or BESSIE. BESSIE is the administrative body for all Louisiana public elementary and secondary schools. Garvey has served in numerous capacities at Bessie since 2007 and is a CPA and attorney. State Representative Patricia Haynes-Smith is a Democrat from Baton Rouge, serving her third term in the legislature. She is a former teacher and president of the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board. Representative Smith serves on the House Education Committee. Michael Falk is the superintendent of the Central Community School System, one of the many affected by August's record floods, roughly 60% of the central school employees suffered flood damage, including Mr. Falk himself. The central school district received an A from the state education department in 2013 and 2014. Before we go to our audience questions, I'd first like to ask each member of the panel briefly, from your perspective, what letter grade would you assign the state's education system? Mr. Richard? It's a great question, Bob. Uh, a little known fact about Louisiana's letter grade labeling system is uh, that not only do we use grades A through F, but we also have a designation of T for transition in our state law. And because I believe, and, and many uh, folks that we work with believe that the accountability system is incomplete, I think at this time, due to the number of transitions that we're dealing with in Louisiana, a fair grade would be a letter grade of T. T, okay, Mr. Garvey. <laughs> uh, I'd split it into a couple of categories. If you look at where we are today, snapshot I'd say we're not doing very well a lot of national rankings have us ranked down at the bottom uh, if you're doing a snapshot I would say a D that's what I think one of the recent newspaper articles gave us if you looked at the effort that I think that the teachers and administrators around the state are putting into making changes uh, I would say more like a B or maybe even a little bit higher and if you look at the recent gains uh, in several different categories, we are leading the country in gains in ACT scores and some of our, uh, not LEAP scores, but uh, NAEP scores. Um, we're leading the country, uh, top one, two, or three in the nation. So I'd say in the gains that we are making over the last four years or so, I would give us a letter grade again of a B or maybe a little bit higher. Okay. Representative Smith. I really like the, uh, the way that uh, Scott couched his... Um, method of determining a T, but I, I really have to say that I'm really concerned about the accountability uh, plan in general, mainly because I don't really think it's a plan. Uh, we've changed the letter grades over so many years, making sure that either whether an A is really an A or B is a B, and we've changed the number consistently. Uh, I've even heard the superintendent say an A really in an A school is not an A. So, for me, I think that a D or D minus is going to be the letter grade that I would give the system at this time, and I really think we need to look better at our accountability plan in general for letter grades. Okay. Mr. Falk. Looking, uh, putting it in perspective, I would say that uh, the current system I would rate as a C minus, and then until we align our accountability system and our standards to where we be we would be compared apples to apples on a national level. I believe that that's where our mo movement should be so that we would align our accountability system and the standards so that we can accurately compare our school systems with school systems across the nation. Okay, now we're going to go to questions from our studio audience for our panel, and uh, I'd like to call on Raymond first for yeah, your question. So, so one of the highest subset of non-graduates are black males. I mean, my first son was born when I was 18. He's a senior in college, going to pharmacy school. My youngest son is a senior in, in high school, 33 on the ACT, 4.6. But so many black males are not graduating in East Baton Rouge Parish. Between 42 percent, 42 to 48 percent of black males are graduating. So what do you feel are the efforts to really uh, look out for the opportunities for black males in the state? I think that the issue of black males is truly systemic with what's happening in our country today. Uh, I, I can recall as a teacher myself 
uh, watching individuals come into the classroom and uh, and listening to other teachers in the mannerism in which they would approach many of our young black males coming into the classroom. But I think that there's such a fear that has been built up in a lot of schools regarding the black male, their attitudes, their, their cultures, and the way that they come into school. Um, it really need, we really need to have a culture shock change in dealing with our black males in school. Uh, I, I think that we have to uh, look at what we are teaching, how we approach them, and in order for a young male to sit in a classroom and learn, there has to be someone at the, begin at the head of the class, at the head of the, that classroom, who takes an interest in making sure that that young person really is going to learn. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll give it a shot, a, a quick, quick point that we often lose sight of as far as priorities in our state when it when it comes to funding one of the most glaring inconsistencies that we experience that often goes overlooked is how much we spend per capita as a state on our prison system versus what we're spending per pupil on education mm -hmm. and I think until we can better align how we spend dollars as far as educating our, our youth especially in the early grades in pre-k and refocus that priority uh, that that would be we're going to still experience the problems that we're experiencing with with uh, at-risk students especially black males and I think one of the important things uh, has to deal with relationships and the way that uh, you speak to people and the way you try to work with people and I think part of that we have to spend more time training our teachers to be able to understand the kids that are coming into their classrooms today so they can better communicate and the child will feel that the teacher is listening to them and be more open to, to sharing and developing that relationship. And then I think an important uh, part is reaching males and females at an earlier age and begin to guide them along a path that you can show them they can be a productive citizen in society and what they need to have to get to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, I did take a shot at that too. Um, I'd start by saying we have a long way to go. We are not where we need to be on this issue. But <clears throat> the superintendent that we have is very focused on this issue. Almost every meeting that I go to, he mentions it. I was at a meeting this morning and he mentioned it as one of the biggest issues to focus on. And I'd point out uh, my papers that I had with the, my cheat sheet on it uh, was taken away. So I'll, I'll do the numbers roughly. But if you look at the number of African American students that are achieving advanced placement credit in, for college in high school. Uh, if you look at just in general in Louisiana, we have incredibly increased the number of credit that our children are earning for college while they're in high school. I think we've doubled it over the last four years. The African American population is exceeding the state average in that. So that gap is closing. And if you look at the college attendance rate, the uh, rate of African Americans and children in Louisiana in av on average that are going to college as opposed to four years ago, that rate has gone through the roof too. I think it's one of the highest improvement rates in the country. The African American rate is higher than the state average. So again, on that measurement we are closing the gap and I think over the past few years we have been recognized uh, nationwide mm -hmm. as in general on the NAEP closing the gap in our minorities uh, be it African-American or other minorities. So I think we're making improvements, but we have a long way to go with it. Arthur, your, uh, your company deals with underprivileged mm -hmm. students and children. You may have a question that would draw this out a little more. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing, one comment to your question, Raymond. Um, our nonprofit supports families that are struggling financially, and uh, a majority of the kids that we serve are African-American and also are males. So I think fortunately in our state, there are some initiatives right now that have either been taken or are about to be taken that are gonna give that hand up to those young men that really just want a chance. That's all they want. And um, my question to y'all really stems from that. You have so many kids that are in failing schools and so many kids, especially in poverty, um, that find themselves in such tough academic situations, not including all the other, um, you know, challenges that they face on a daily basis. What are we doing to address those failing schools, but specifically, what are we doing to help kids 
that are in poverty, that are coming from those broken homes and situations to mobilize them, to get them beyond, um, you know, where they're at now and that cycle of poverty. I think one, uh, I, I served as superintendent in the Delta region in Northeast Louisiana, which is one of the poorest regions in the state, and they have the third poorest county in the nation. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we have to look is adequate resources to be able to provide to educate children and get them to a level. What does it take in the form of adequate resources to drive a performance level? And I think you'd find that children in poverty, the higher the percentage of poverty, the more influx that you have to have of resources because they come to school deprived, they do not have the resources at home, Many times the parents can't be involved because they're dry, just trying to keep their heads above water. So I think once you determine what does it cost adequately to give that child the resources they need to attain a certain level of education, I think you can, you can make a big difference. Uh, who else wants to get in on this? Sure, I'll take a shot okay. at it. Uh, uh, there's, it's a complicated, <clears throat> question and, and deserves a, a, an in-depth answer that I don't know we have enough time on this show uh, to talk about, but in general, we all know what works to help kids that are at risk. We know that the earlier you reach at-risk students with a high quality education, the better chance you give them to be college and career ready. We mentioned misalignment or a lack of alignment earlier in some of the, the earlier comments in the program. Our state has moved from initiative to initiative to initiative, but all at the same time knowing exactly what works, high quality pre-K, especially for at-risk students. We have to start earlier, we have to dedicate our resources to starting earlier. And I, I would also say that uh, the whole reform movement, our so-called reform movement in Louisiana has really worked to pit business and industry and other stakeholders against traditional education. Uh, with the use of letter grades, so to speak, in, in some ways. And in other states, they found a way to bring everybody together and work collectively with a, a concerted effort to bring all stakeholders to the table and not be at odds with each other and not keep pointing the finger saying, it's your fault, it's your fault, but to pool those resources collectively. And I, I look forward to the day where we can move in that direction. Representative Smith? Yeah, uh, poverty is one, is one of the biggest issues that uh, school systems face across the country. Some have found ways to work through the issues of poverty. Louisiana has not yet gotten there and I say that because you can't just deal with poverty in the school system. You have to look at the holistic piece of where that child's co child comes from. The family aspect, the environment that they're living in, uh, what are the city services that they're receiving uh, uh, in the area where they live in. You know, I. If you don't look at it from that whole piece of the child, education won't solve poverty. It will not solve it at all because you can educate that child, but they go back to the same environment that they come from to get to school. So it's going to take not only the educational piece, but your city resources, as um, Superintendent Falker said, all the resources that you need to make that child be whole have to be put together in order for them to be looked at of being able to come out of poverty. Uh, as you know, giving parents choice through your company uh, so that if a school is not working for them, they can choose another school is just a piece of it. And uh, as Scott mentioned, sometimes that pits some people against other people uh, or some groups against other groups. But something that we're doing that I think is bringing all of the groups together is an issue that really affects this. If you look at low performing schools, one of the statistics that you see that stands out is that brand new teachers tend to get put into those schools. And the initiative that we have now that is going to require a year-long uh, residency for teachers who are not yet graduated from teaching school, <clears throat> to spend a year in the classroom under a mentor teacher, spend a whole year with them before they graduate, will give you a teacher, and this goes to some of what Prudence was talking about, a teacher that is much more experienced on day one. And when you're dealing with failing schools and failing schools that have an outsized number of brand new teachers, one, two, or three years old, I think that this will make a tremendous difference in those schools. Does the, um, 
every uh, uh, student, every child, every student succeeds act, right? Uh, does, does, what does it do to address this, this issue? It, there's a, a, a part of the uh, program that uh, allows for specifics on teacher preparation mm -hmm. and teacher preparation programs. And uh, each state, I believe, has to submit a plan mm -hmm. in regard to that. And then if their plan is approved, then I believe the U.S. Department of Education will funnel some money through uh, its uh, funding so that the state can address that initiative. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. ESA is, is very important, I would say, to the initiative that I mentioned a minute ago with the one-year residency because, as Superintendent Falk mentioned, there is some extra money in that recently passed ESSA legislation that will help pay for some of the extra costs to get this residency done. Okay. And the issue there is going to be beginning the program but sustaining, sustaining it, it so that we can have that feeder program continuous right. and it's just not a short-term fix exactly. but a long-term. Okay. So um, I want to turn to Joe and Peggy over here because they're, they're, they're very involved with the, with the uh, PTA and parents are a big part of this. Major. I suspect you have a a question Major. that aims at that. Well, they have the Family Engagement Act right now. It's trying to get the families more involved with the students in the school systems. Uh, one of the things I would like to say, just a quick diversion, I rate the state as a C, and I'll tell you why. Thousands of young men and women have left the state of Louisiana to enlist in the military. They have done an outstanding job in our military, and they would not be successful if they had not been educated properly in our state. That's very important to know. The uh, Parent Teacher Association works with the, the principals, with the school teachers. We're from St. Tammany Parish, and Tammany is an A school district. In our district, more than half of the people of the PTA members in the entire state are from St. Tammany. The, the supervisor, the superintendent of schools, Trey Fulce, is active with PTA. He sits in PTA board meetings and he promotes PTA and parent involvement. So you go to basketball games, football games, school nights, the PTA is there to help. We want to get people involved. So how do we get, how do we get parents more involved? Yeah. Well, I would say, um, as Joe was saying, St. Tammany, in my opinion, is a shining example of getting parents involved in their schools. And I've seen a lot of different parishes across the state, and none of them, and I'm sure that there are some other ones out there that are as good as St. Tammany, but none that I have seen yet so far. And it comes from the top with Trey Falls pushing to have his schools make parents feel welcome on the campuses. Um, how to replicate Trey Falls in St. Tammany, I'm not sure, but uh, I would say looking to them as an example would be a good way to start. But I don't think there's a one size that fits yeah. all for, for every school district uh, because you have a lot of school districts where parents work two, three, four jobs trying to make ends meet and would never have an opportunity to get to a PTA meeting. Some can't even make parent-teacher uh, meetings just during the daytime because they don't have that ability to take off from work. So th there's got to be some creative way of being able to engage those parents as well in, uh, in the school. And of course, making the school, all school districts should be making their parents welcome to come to the schools, no matter where they are. But, but most importantly, you've got to look at how do you engage those working parents that are really struggling to make sure there's food on their table for their kids to eat. You and have that, it doesn't always work. Have that issue in your school system. Well, is, yeah. we're the newest school system mm -hmm. in the state. Mm -hmm. You know, we've ten, we started our 10th year. And the, the reason why we've been successful and uh, we've been able to perform at high levels is because of the engagement of our mm -hmm. parents and the quality classroom teachers, the teachers mm -hmm. that we have in every room. And as, as others have mentioned, it's, it's the way a parent feels received at the school that sets the stage. The other thing, and you may think that it's, it's not important, but the appearance of the school from the outside, it has to be very appealing, it has to be neat, it has to be attractive. And then the feeling of parents that their child is safe at the school. When you get those things, a combination of those things, then the parents feel like this is a place I want my child to be, I want to be involved with my child. Yep. If I could just re recap what I said before and twist it just a little bit. Um, I think as Superintendent Folk was saying, 
it, it starts with the attitude of the administration of wanting to have the parents come in and making it known in the community that the administration wants the parents to come in. I've seen some districts where the leadership really doesn't see the benefits of having the parents come in and maybe you know the department could lead this by doing a study that shows documents how with more parental involvement you get better grades from your students and if we can prove it I think we could swing some of the administrators around the state over to believing the thought that getting more parents involved really helps with the uh, production from the students. It's true, sure. It's a key component of any school's success. We live in a very diverse state. Uh, what works in St. Tammany, as Representative Smith said, may not work in some other districts. And we have to be cognizant of that. And we've gone the full spectrum over the years as far as parenting centers located on our school campuses to programs that uh, work with parents to help them be parents. Mm -hmm. And there are dollars dedicated in the new ESSA Act to encourage more parental involvement and, and we hope to be a part of crafting what that looks like as stakeholders moving forward as our state plan is drafted. Hiles? Sure. Uh, I'm in West Felicia in a parish, uh, superintendent there. One of the key successes, and you guys have all uh, uh, touched on it, whether it be high expectations and relationships with the four, the four pieces of this, it's just like your chair. Your chair is very strong because all four legs have to work. You have to have parent involvement. You have to have students who will live up to high expectations. You have to have employees who live up to high expectations. And your community has to allocate resources to make that work. If any of those pieces are weak, then you begin to, to struggle. But bigger than that, that may be something that is sort of a one size fits all because it doesn't matter if you're in East Baton Rouge Parish in West Feliciana or St. Tammany. If we're gonna be more competitive as a state, if we want to compete with everyone, why don't we start off by universal pre-K across the state? And that's a huge amount of money. But I said in a parish that, that seats Angola. And my question to community and everyone who's passionate about improving education, why are we spending so many dollars at Angola and you can come down to my schools and see my pre-K program. If you want to see what bridges the gap to bring parents in, no matter what resources they have, if I can get students who become successful as they walk into kindergarten, I'm going to have success. We were second in ACT this year. Uh, we're always in the top 10. And there are a lot of reasons. Those four legs have to stand strong. But bigger than that, that a place like East Baton Rouge Parish or other places in the state is an investment in pre-K. So Anybody would like to respond to that? I think Representative Smith might be our person I for that. I would love <clears throat> to see uh, more pre-K programs, quality pre-K programs in the state of Louisiana. Uh, but I was astounded by, of course, the suspension and expulsion report that came out recently that showed the number of pre-K kids we're putting out of school. That's really uh, not a good example for our pre-K program. So uh, I think that the, the state uh, would able to get the dollars to be able to invest into pre-K because it's not a part of our formula and being able to find those dollars and sustain the dollars. It cannot be something as we're doing right now, band-aiding our pre-K programs with federal dollars from here and federal dollars from there or you know the little bit of state money that we put in. It has to be a sustainable means of financing and I believe that we're trying to work on some things to look at that for next funding cycle. Alex? Absolutely. Um, I'd like to begin by first saying that I really commend our schools and our teachers overall. They do an amazing job because they meet students where they are. Not necessarily where we want them to be, but they meet students where they are and then they have a difficult task in getting them across the line. My question is, and I appreciate the point about the four stools because there's one critical component we touched on earlier, our teachers and support staff. My question is, what percentage of the budget do we dedicate towards professional development to help stand up our teachers who are doing well and for those who are struggling to help stand them up? Part of the budget uh, that we receive, we have some title funds, Title II, that we use specifically for professional development. And uh, depending on the financial situation in each district, you find that a lot of the successful districts focus a lot on staff development, not only with teachers, but the paraprofessionals because they work in the classroom. Right. And then as you choose initiatives, you choose those 
that are proven to be successful, and then you give your staff the resources that they need to have to be successful. Mm -hmm. And we try to involve our teachers in the programs because what happens is if you do something from the top down, you don't have to buy in. That's right. So we, we have leadership teams at each right. school. We do professional learning communities. We have their involvement so they can help decide the course. Mm -hmm. Um, so as mentioned earlier very briefly about school choice and that being one of our reform efforts in Louisiana um, and I wanted to kind of ask you all how is our voucher system and our charter school system and that movement towards charter schools and providing choice helping out those schools that we've deemed as failing and we're allowing the students to move from how is that system helping those schools that are still there and those students that are still in the schools that aren't doing very well because it seems like we're disinvesting and we're providing other opportunities for some students, but then you have a large population of students <coughs> who are still in those schools and who are oftentimes low income and are lacking resources, and those are being pulled out of their schools. So what are we doing for them? I'll give it a shot. Uh, it, it's an excellent question uh, because the jury is, is somewhat still out. Uh, you can't force a parent to send their child to a particular school. And we find that even though choice is offered in many of our districts that have low performing schools, it's that community school, it's that neighborhood school that they believe in. And that's why in the earlier segment we talked about the validity of letter grades and is it really a true measure of what the school is doing and how successful the school is or not successful. So it's, it's a difficult question and I, I think where we are now is you have such a uh, an adverse relationship because we're all struggling for the same dollar to educate that student and you still have you may have a voucher school that may not be educating students better than the community school that's in that neighborhood and a charter school around the corner that's also in the same boat and in some places it's working better than others and I think, I think there needs to be more effort put into that measure of, of truly assessing to find out the answer to your question. Mr. Carvey? I'd uh, start out by saying that a lot of the charter schools that are out there are type one charter schools or type three charter schools, which means that they were uh, charters issued by the local school boards, uh, which in essence means the local school boards are overseeing those charter schools and it's their school. Uh, a lot of people think charter schools are all issued or uh, authorized by the state, by Bessie, and not by the locals, and that's just not true. Um, to the extent that the locals are authorizing these, I would assume that they are authorizing them because they think it will improve their whole school system, uh, which would include the schools that are not charters but are in that school district. Put that aside for a second and look at the vouchers that you talked about before. If a school is not working for a child and that child's parents decide that they would be better off in a voucher receiving school, <clears throat> then I think that taking that child who doesn't fit well in that school out of that school probably helps the teachers that are remaining in that school because they have a higher percentage of students who think that school fits for them. So if you take something out that doesn't fit, I think that helps the people that are remaining in the school. But to your point about it taking dollars out of the school system, if you look at the number of students that are in vouchers or that are taking vouchers, uh, it's 8,000, 9,000, 10,000, and, and that has grown from zero over the last, let's say, 10 years. If you look at the number of students in Louisiana in public schools over the last 10 years, it has grown by more like 50,000. So the state is sending 40,000 more students worth of dollars to the locals more than what it has put into the voucher system. So we have put more money into the locals than we have removed from vouchers. So I don't think it's hurting the local schools. Uh, Just a quick follow up. Yeah. I, I, think, I think Mr. Gar I would have to respectfully disagree with Mr. Garvey's assessment of, of the number of charter schools and the type charter schools in Louisiana, the vast majority were approved by Bessie or in the recovery school district and not by local school boards. Exactly. We encourage our local school boards to, 
to look at that option if it's something that they feel right. is best, but the vast majority mm -hmm. are in recovery school district and, and, and not doing too well. I agree that a lot of them, I don't know if you said the vast majority, but a lot of them were, are currently as of today, are in the recovery school district, but legislation was passed on the last legislative session that takes all the ones in Orleans Parish, which are the vast majority, I think there's 50 charter schools in Orleans Parish, mm -hmm. type fives that are authorized by Bessie, there's maybe another 10 type fives across the state, maybe 15. So 50 of the 75. 20 type twos that are authorized by Bessie right. or more. Those are all going back to the Orleans Parish School Board within the next, I think it's mandated within the next two years now. It was three years when the legislation was passed almost a year ago. So those 50 will be under local control and uh, local governance. East Baton Rouge Parish started the first charter schools under their purview, and they've been successful, those charters that they have with a local school district generally are uh, doing well. The issues that I, I see with charters is the unlevel playing field. Uh, you mentioned replicating. The charter started out to be an experiment. Uh, we had a very healthy discussion uh, during this last uh, session about whether or not it really was to be an experiment. An experiment meaning you replicate what's good going on in the charter and you move it to an actual traditional school. That has never happened in this state. So we've asked even to take it out of the charter uh, language that it's not an experiment but, when it, but it's still in that language that uh, the charters are supposed to be experimental schools. Uh, they are actually doing the very same thing that traditional public schools are doing, so they're not experimental schools. The issue with the vouchers and my issue with the State Department is the way that they have changed the method in which uh, children go to those schools. Uh, presently, uh, more sc schools are accepting only kindergarten students. They're not accepting upper age level students, and that means that they're given more time in order for them to be able to bring those children up to par. They'll also, st uh, teachers have the ability to determine whether or not that child passes or not. Whereas, we don't do the same thing in traditional schools. So, the, the playing fields are not level, even though you're sending the same, same state dollars uh, to both of those entities. And they're not the panacea of reform efforts. I recently was in uh, a symposium with early childhood learners and heard from Illinois who decided that they wanted their public schools to work and they've done a complete turnaround of all their public schools uh, by in initiating all reforms but they have no charters or vouchers and they've even moved their scores up in the, on the national level so that you can do it you just have it takes a concerted effort to do it okay so we've only got two minutes left uh, so I want to go we, we can't we can't end this this uh, evening without at least getting one question from a student so Kira you want to you want to take it uh, mine's is more of a comment not a question um, I go to a mom and pop charter school um, we were the only charter school for two years in St. Landry Parish or Lafayette Parish and now there are two more charter schools in Lafayette Parish and one of them is a failing school. My school is a top game school and we also have dual enrollment programs. I feel as if um, dual, enro dual enrollment programs help children want to succeed more because they have a better chance of going to college or picking up a trade where they can actually make money. And I feel as if um, Louisiana we have the biggest we have the biggest achievement standards but we have the biggest achievement gap and they're keep they're they're being raised every year how do students actually close that gap whenever the achievements are growing each year it's difficult for the students but it's also difficult for the schools the individual schools when you change every year the requirements you can't ever wrap your hands around what's expected and be able to plan now you mentioned dual enrollment and for a period of time the state focus was on dual enrollment courses mm -hmm. and the reimbursement for dual enrollment. That shifted now to where more weight is placed on the advanced placement right. and yes we're making gains with advanced placement but we must not forget about the students who want to That's access right. the dual enrollment to help them prepare for a trade by going to uh, ABC in these trade facilities, you have that part of your student body that also needs that extra education and right. preparation. Our, our time is up, so I, we need to kind of wrap it up. So I'm going to give everybody a chance to, 
just a very brief uh, uh, final remark. So we'll, we'll start here on me and Mr. Richard. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, LPB, for, for having this program. It's one that we hopefully uh, will revisit because it warrants so much more discussion, and we appreciate y'all having us tonight. Thank you. Mr. Carp? I'd use my wrap-up to address yeah, the last question. As I mentioned earlier, the focus that we have been putting on advanced placement courses over the last few years um, has increased the number of high, of high school students that are getting college credit uh, across Louisiana, but the gains in the minority population has been just about double what the gains have been statewide on average. So I think we're helping <clears throat> the population you were talking about with that. And to go to what Superintendent Folk was talking about, about dual enrollment in general, not just advanced placement, we are putting, in the last couple of years, we have put more emphasis on the dual enrollment, giving more credit in the school letter grades to students who are doing dual enrollment, uh, trying to get it even with AP advanced placement. We're not quite there yet, but I think we're moving in that direction, so I think that will help. Representative Smith? Yes, this is a conversation that needs to happen at every single dinner table, breakfast table, uh, wherever you are, because the only way for this state to be the great state it can be is through improving its educational system. And we can't do it without the resources, so we need the community, we need the business community, uh, everyone pulling together in order to make, whether it's a traditional public school, whether it's a charter school, it's important that those individuals realize that the only way that we can be better is to have a great group of individuals who are educated through our systems. Mr. Falk, you have the final word. Uh, I've been in education 46 years in this state. I've seen a, a lot of good things and bad things. I think we do have room for improvement, but I think until we all work together and pull the wagon in the same direction, we're not gonna get where our kids and our teachers where they need to be, and we won't make this state the great state it can be. Okay, thank you. Well, we've run out of time for our question and answer segment. We'd like to thank our panelists, Mr. Garvey, Mr. Richard, Representative Smith, and Superintendent Falk for their insight on this month's topic. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square and comment on tonight's show. We'd love to hear from you. You can also view prior episodes of Louisiana Public Square on your mobile device with the LPB app available from your provider's app store. In November, Louisiana voters won't be just electing a new president, but a new U.S. Senator and for some a new representative. So what concerns are on citizens' minds as they go to the polls this fall and what issues should be on the mind of Louisiana's next congressional leaders? Join Louisiana Public Square next month for election 2016. Thanks for watching and good night. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you.